Let's talk about color space in the wild. These are a few of the different setups you're going to see when you're working with footage. First is sort of a log or a raw image. This is again, very flat, very milky. Everything's really, you know, desaturated. And that's a pretty standard file that you're going to see. This is where it's really important to know what color space your source footage came from so that you can properly linearize it. The next thing you're going to see is based on file type. And if you actually look at your color tab in your project settings, you'll see that 8-bit files have a specific color space that they want to be looked up at. And you can modify this. I think default it's gamma 1.8. I usually set it to sRGB. But if you were to load a file in, and these original source files were actually MP4s and are 8-bit, if I drag in the MP4, it wants to default my color space to gamma 1.8. That's not correct. It's just assuming that based on the file type. It doesn't know that the footage was shot in S-Log3. So that's really something to be aware of when you're dragging in, you know, when you're adding read nodes is it's really basing their initial lookup on this default if there isn't a metadata flag stating otherwise. The next type of file you're going to deal with is a properly linearized file. So in this case, our read node has a color space knob and it's set to S-Log3. This footage was shot S-Log3, so this is the proper linearization for this footage. The other thing you're going to bump into in the wild is graded footage. So this is the same clip, but this is run through a color grading process and then re-exported. Depending on the workflow, this is what a lot of compositing works on, especially in the commercial workflow. So here you can see all of our black levels are really dark and, you know, crunchy. Our highlights are exposed properly. We have, you know, saturation that's either been brought to normal or even boosted a little bit. These also have a color space, and it's really important to know what that is. Depending on the color suite that created the graded footage, you need to be aware of what that native color space is coming off of that timeline. In this case, I graded this and I output it as linear. A lot of times you're going to see graded footage come in as Rec. 709 because that's what the native timeline for the color suite is. So it's really important to be aware of that as well. And just because it's graded doesn't mean that you need to disregard the color space. Let's talk about LUTs, CDLs, and grades. A LUT stands for lookup table, and that's basically taking one data point and pushing it to another. We can actually see that when we look at our curves over here. You know, our X and Y axes on our graph, it's saying take any value that's 0.1 and make that 0.35 when we're looking at an sRGB curve. That's what a LUT's doing, it's just doing it in a table form and not in an algorithm form. Nuke's using algorithms to generate these curves. A LUT just creates a table. LUTs can be used for a few different things. They can be used creatively or they can be used technically. Creatively, they're just creating a delta change where they're pushing your saturation in your greens or they're boosting your black levels a little bit or bringing your highlights down. They can also be used to convert from one color space to another or to linearize your footage. Next up are CDLs. CDLs stand for color decision list. This is typically a sidecar file that's generated on set. Occasionally they can be created after the fact in a, a pre-light or a first look on a grade. But a CDL is effectively creating a look. So it's being added to your footage to give it a look that represents more what the final look will be. You're going to use this to basically preview what your comp work will look like when color does what they want to do to it. Graded footage, like we talked about before, this means it's been colored to its final look. Most of the time, this is going to be baked in. Occasionally, you'll, you'll get this back as a LUT file of some sort or as a graded file. So I want to talk about the workflow with CDLs and LUTs a little bit also because there are some ramifications of how those work inside of Nuke. A LUT, because it can be both technical and creative and it can be doing the linearization, it's important to understand the difference and understand how to work with those tools. So here we have two clips. It's the same clip. One we're looking at it in log space, the other we're looking at it linearized. So here we have a vector field node. A vector field is what you use to load in a LUT file and it can load a few different kinds of LUTs in. Here I'm using a manufacturer provided S-Log3 to Rec. 709 LUT. And a lot of times you're going to see manufacturer files for linearizing their footage. 
And there are a ton of different files for that also. Depending on what camera manufacturer you're using, which camera model, and what color spaces you're shooting internally, you might use a different LUT. That might be baked into Nuke, or it might be a separate process where you have to use a node to do that linearization. So here we're seeing this file. We're linearizing it. It looks a little bit different than the way Nuke linearizes it. That's just the way the manufacturer set it up. And then we have another vector field where we're loading in a LUT, and this LUT is doing the linearization and adding a creative look. So here you can see it's really pushing the greens and blues and the shadows and playing with the saturation across the green and blue. You can really see the difference here. So the important thing to note here is that if we were to do any work on this, we wouldn't want to do the work on top of a creative LUT. Usually creative LUTs can be destructive. They're either clipping highlights or they're clipping shadows. And they also don't always wind up being the final look. So if we were to do all of our work using a CDL or using a creative look, it could cause problems down the road where the colorist or the director or someone else changes their mind and they want that scene to look a completely different way. So we want to always do our work before we do before we apply any creative looks. And we really just want to apply those so that we can see how it's going to look. So if we were to do the work, we would do the work here before that LUT, but then we're working in log space, and we don't want to work in log space because our tools aren't built for that. Our tools are built to work in linear space, and they're not going to give you the result that you want. So here's how you would work around that. So here we've properly linearized our footage, and now we're actually using the same file, but we've changed some of our settings. So our color space in is now slog3, which matches what we're using to linearize. And if you view this, you'll see that it's actually the same. But now we can work on this clip in linear space without having to worry about that creative look messing things up. And an example of this is, say we add a little color correction here, and we'll push the gamma and we'll push the gain, and we can view it through our vector field. Push the gamma down, we'll gain up just a little just kind of massaging it a little bit. But if we were to take this and duplicate it and add it here, you'll see now we have two very different results. And that's because this is not, this is working on log footage. It's not working on linearized footage. And you can see it really makes a big difference in how those tools operate. So next up, let's talk about CDLs and how those kind of work. A CDL is a very simplified grade tool. It basically gives you gain, gamma, offset, and saturation. There's a few options. You can bake them out as files. You can load them in as files. You also can just manually enter in the information. If we tick off our read from file, you can see we have direct control over those inputs. In this case, we're using a file that I created in Nuke. Some CDL files are created on camera when they shoot. Others are created by a third-party application you know, either the NLE or another capture software. A CDL works the same way. It's creating a look. It's something we want to look at. When you're working with these, you're going to connect them into your script so that you can see what they're doing. There's actually a better way to do that, and that's called an input process. An input process allows you to attach what that tool is doing to your viewer process and not to your node graph. So here we have the same CDL. And what we'll do is we'll view our original footage. We'll select our CDL here. And then we can go to our edit menu, go to node, and then go to use as input process. You can then see we have this IP button turns on in our top left corner. So if we toggle that on and off, now we're applying that color, but we're only applying it in the viewer space. The really nice thing about this is it's not going to be passed through in a render. If you're using a node and you're connecting it into your node tree, there's always the off chance that you might render it by accident. We definitely don't want to bake our creative looks in. We want to just look at it and make sure everything looks correct when we're looking at it with that creative look. And it's more of a check for editorial. Ultimately, these will go to final color and that'll be applied directly by the colorist. So let's talk about working with footage. So we have a couple different scenarios here. So we have our log footage. It comes in really flat. We'll turn off our input process. Then we're going to go through the step of linearizing it. So here we're using a color space tool. And there's the OCIO color space and there's also a nuke color space node that do the same thing. 
So here we've linearized it. Now this looks correct. Then we'd want to do some work. Say we're doing some color correction or we're adding some other pieces and parts in. Then before we write it out, we want to inverse that linearization. We want to put it back to log space. The idea behind this too, I like to think of it as same, same. So if we read in with one color space, we want to write out with that same color space. That way, if this is opened in another suite, if it's opened with a different color space, all of our work is relative to that color space and we're not baking in any color space transforms. And then we would have our write out and that would complete the life cycle of this comp. Nuke is nice because it bakes that process in for us. So if we look at this side, and if we actually open our read node, you can see our color space is set to slog3. So now we're reading in and linearizing at the same time. Then we have our space where we're working in linear. And then for our output, it's the same as the read. We can actually write out and inverse the linearization at the same time using the read node. So in this case, we're setting our color space to slog3. And one of the most common things I see is when you read something in, you know, Alexa log C or S log, very often artists forget to set the color space on their write out. And so they wind up writing it in, you know, they write it out as the default, which is usually set by the file type. So for EXR be linear, if it's an MOV or some other image format, it's usually going to be sRGB or, or Cineon. So here we can set S log three and our resulting image, if we were to read it back in, would look exactly like our read, regardless of which color space we had it loaded into. If we loaded it in log or raw, it would look the same. If we linearized it as S log two or S log three, they would match. You know, like, again, I want to call that same, same. And that's a really safe way to work. You know, if you're not sure about a color space, but you work same, same, you're usually going to be safe. The only gotcha there is there are a couple of color spaces that don't have hyper black or hyper white. And that means that if you have any values below zero or above one, those are going to clip. SRGB is a really good example of that. Say you were to load this in SRGB and it wasn't supposed to be SRGB and you had values that passed one. If you write it back out SRGB, all those values are going to become clipped. All right, so that covers general working color space.